App registration in Azure AD is a topic where many of you preparing for Microsoft exams have shared that you struggle. And so today we're going to try to do something about that. I'm going to walk through app registration, explaining key concepts in plain English, and I'm going to do it all in about 15 minutes. Let's get started. App registration in Azure AD is one of those rough spots we're going to try to smooth out today. So stick with me for the next 15 minutes or so. And if at the end of this video you still have questions, leave them in the comment section and we'll cover those off one by one. So let's create an app registration together and I'll talk you through the concepts as we create and configure. So it begins by logging in at portal.azure.com and then I'll select Azure Active Directory. So you might wonder, why do I need to create an app registration in the first place? So I'll click app registrations here, so I'm where I need to begin. Uh, for every app that you want the Microsoft Identity Platform to, to basically perform identity and access management, you need to register the app. It doesn't matter if it's a client app, like a web app or a mobile app or a web API that a client talks to. This registration is establishing a trust relationship between your app and the identity provider, which in this case is Microsoft's identity platform, you know, Azure AD. So I'm going to click on new registration here, and I need to start with a user facing, think of this as a friendly display name. So I'm going to call this just example app for purposes of our discussion here. Now you'll notice I need to tell Azure AD what types of identities this application is going to use and what the scope is. And I have four options here. So first I have accounts in this organizational directory only, so just this Azure AD tenant. This is what you'd call a line of business app. I could use accounts in any organizational directory. So this is what you'd use if you were a software company that was building a software as a service application that you were going to sell to multiple orgs. You'd pick any org directory. Now if I also wanted to support personal accounts, the uh, the Microsoft accounts they call them, or MSA, I'd pick any organizational directory and personal accounts. And then if I was using apps for use only by personal accounts, so a consumer app, then I'd pick Microsoft accounts only. So in this case, let's assume I'm creating a line of business app for my corporate users. I have the redirect URI here, which you notice is, is mentioned as optional. So the redirect URI, or what's sometimes called the reply URL, is the location where the authorization server is going to send the user once the app has been successfully authorized and granted an authorization code or an access token. So authorization in this case is coming from Azure AD from our Azure Active Directory. So I'll click register. When I click register, the app registration is created. This creates two objects. So I'm going to back up a level and I want to show you these objects and then I'll explain what they are and how they're different essentially. So under app registrations, uh, I'll just navigate away and navigate back to app registrations here. And you'll see the application object. That's the first of two objects created by this app registration. So the application object here is the global definition of the application in our in our tenant. And if I click in here, I have several configurable properties. We're going to go through these in just a moment. I'm going to pop back up to the top level here. And the other object that was created in this case, when I go under Enterprise Applications, I'll see a service principle that was created. And I can click here and see some properties on the service principle. So this service principle is an instance of an application. It's a local concrete object. And it's going to inherit properties from that application object. It'll have a reference back there through an application ID. And we'll see here records of local user and group application and, and role assignments. We're going to come back to this in just a moment. I want to pop back up to our global object, to that app registration, and to the application object here. And we want to look at just some of the properties here. So here under branding, I can put a logo. I can put a link to my terms of service, my privacy statement, etc. So in a corporate scenario, this might not be so important. If I choose that option for multiple Azure AD tenants for a SaaS app, for example, uh, 
terms of service, privacy statements, these are all going to be very important. And when I go down here to owners, owners is where I can manage who is authorized to help manage this registration. So this is where I can add other administrators that could help take care of this registration over time. So still here looking at our, our application object, that global definition of our app, I'm going to go from owners down to manifest. And the manifest is essentially a JSON representation of our registration. So if we have some property we need to modify that's not represented in the, the portal UI anywhere, we could come here to the JSON and edit this directly. So for example, if I wanted to set allow public client to true, I can set that value save my changes, done. So if it's not represented in the UI or you're just an awesome nerd who loves to edit JSON directly, there you have it. Now our app's going to need permissions and the permissions that are required will, will vary by you know the function of our application, but I'll go under API permissions here and I can see the permissions that have already been granted. So here we can list permissions that our application is going to request statically. Now we can also request user consent, user consentable permission. So we can ask the user to grant us specific permissions on the fly dynamically through our code. So when it comes to permissions with app registrations, there are two types of permissions. So I'll start by just clicking add a permission. And let's say I'm working with a security app. My app's going to talk to Defender ATP. So I'll go to APIs my organization uses and I'll find Windows Defender ATP. You'll notice that there are two options for permissions listed here. There are delegated permissions, which is what we use when we're accessing an API when a, a physical user is present. And then we have application permissions, and this is where our app's running as a background service. There's no user, essentially. So in this case, I'll say my permission is a delegated permission because I'm expecting a user is there. And what you'll typically notice in these scenarios is there are a huge variety of permissions. So you'll likely wind up wanting to reference permissions for an API you're accessing so you can figure out what permissions are going to be necessary exactly. So maybe my app works with managing Defender ATP alerts. So I can go under alerts and I want my users to be able to read alerts and to update alerts. So I'll add those permissions. So that's my expectation there. Uh, don't be surprised if you need to go look at a reference to, to determine exactly what permissions your app needs. And now we need to talk for a moment about effective permissions for delegated and application permissions. So going back to those two permissions types, okay, uh, when we look at effective permissions, for, for application permissions where it's running as a background service or a daemon without a user present, the effective permissions of the app will be the full level of privileges implied by what we set here. On the delegation side, when we're using delegated permissions, the effective permissions will be the intersection of the delegated permissions our app has been granted and the privileges of the currently signed in user. So the least privileged intersection of the two. So if I set delegated permissions at a higher level and a user has lower permissions, the least privileged intersection of those definitions is what applies. So essentially, I'm not granting the user a permission that they can't already perform with their assigned permission. So if my app expected that a user had the right to delete users from Active Directory, but they did not in fact have that permission, then we would hit a, a divergence here in the least privileged intersection. The app wouldn't work for the user as designed because they don't have rights to, uh, to perform the action that I'm intending. So once I've set those permissions, I've got the bare necessities in place. And I'm going to pop up here to branding on my application object, and I'm going to upload a logo. And I'm going to do this simply to demonstrate how the service principle inherits certain properties from my application object. So I'll go down here and I'll pick a logo and there you see it's uploaded and I'll save my changes. So if you're getting value from this video, do make sure to give us a like and subscribe. Uh, you'll be notified that way every time we add a new
Azure tutorial or exam prep video here. And there's an expectation here that you have a custom domain that you own. So you'll notice here that, that I don't have a custom domain assigned to this lab account. So it shows up as unverified. That's why you're seeing that. So I could update this domain and point it to a, a custom domain that I own and I could resolve that issue. And you'll notice there's a link with, with some background information there that you may want to read if, uh, if you're interested. So let's head back to that local service principal object we talked about and have a look at what's inherited there. So I'll click on Enterprise Applications and I'll click on my example app and you can already see that the logo was inherited. So any, any of the branding information I set flows down from that global application object to this local service principal. And I can look at some properties here. So I'll look at the properties of the app itself here. I just see the ID. I'll see the homepage URL. If I set it, I see the logo. If I go down to owners, no app owner set on the local object. So nothing flowed there. Now let's go to permissions. And you're going to notice here that no permissions have been set. And you're going to notice admin consent and user consent. And you might wonder what is consent exactly. So let's talk about that concept quickly. So consent is essentially a framework based on whether a user or an administrator gives consent for an application that asks for registration in their directory and, and data access to perform those tasks. So our app can prompt a user for consent. So when we're dealing with delegated permissions, for example, Let's say if an app needs to access a user's calendar data in Office 365, we can prompt that user to grant user consent to their calendar data. Admin consent, on the other hand, is where our administrator can grant consent for the app's delegated permission on behalf of all users in the tenant. So in fact, let's go back to the application object. So I'll go back to app registrations. I'll click on my application object. And I'll go back to API permissions and you'll notice that I can grant admin consent here. So this tells me, do you want to grant consent for requested permissions for all accounts in my tenant here? And so I'll hit yes. Consent successful. So that's granted consent for my Azure AD instance, which is called Pete Zerger. So this is my lab. And now when I go back, to Enterprise Applications, and I click on my service principal. So when I click on permissions here, you'll notice that now admin consent, essentially consent for all users in my directory, is complete. So let's say I work in a, a very secure environment and I want to configure some restriction in a user's ability to consent. So I'll Go back up to Enterprise Applications, and I'll go to Consent and Permissions. So here under Consent and Permissions, you'll see that I can determine whether or not a user can grant consent to an application to access data. So I can disallow, or I can allow a user to consent for apps from verified publishers, where that domain shows as verified. And I can also just allow user consent for any app in my organization's data. And you'll notice in the middle ground here, it mentions users can consent for permissions classified as low impact. So if you want to see which permissions are classified as low impact, you have a look in here. And you notice these consent settings say preview. So as long as these say preview, they're very unlikely to show up on AZ500 or any other Microsoft exam. Typically, you're only being tested on generally available information. But the day that becomes generally available, then Microsoft may, you know, add questions to the pool that touch on these settings. Now, what if I wanted to remove or revoke consent? Let's say I wanted to remove an application that was authored in my organization. So if I want to get rid of that application that's authored in my organization, it's pretty easy. I can go back to my Azure AD instance, I can go to app registrations. I can click on that application object and I can delete. Okay. And then once I I'm done, I can hit yes. And that will confirm deletion. 
And incidentally, when that's done, if I go down to Enterprise Applications, I'll see that the service principle is gone as well. But what if it's a multi-tenant scenario, the SaaS app scenario I mentioned, where the application was authored by somebody else, so it wasn't all in-house? Then what I need to do is, in my Azure AD here, I'd go to App Registrations, but this isn't an owned application, right? It's an app created by somebody else. I'd go to All Applications, and I would find the registration here for that SaaS app. So another area I want to touch on are credentials. So your service principles can authenticate using a certificate or a client secret. So as part of that registration, I can configure a credential here. So under Certificates and Secrets, I can provide either a certificate uh, that is used to prove the app's identity when it's requesting a token, or I can supply a password, essentially, which would be a secret. So I could define a secret here. I'll call this my example app secret. I can set an expiration. I'll click Add. Then I'm going to copy that value and take that to my app config or other secure repository where I'll store that secret for my app to use as necessary. So that's 15 minutes of app registration in Azure AD in plain English. I hope this helped, but if you have lingering questions, leave them in the comments and let's talk. Thanks for watching. Take care. <laughs>